And we're going to go into number uh, gram positive rods. And what we're going to see is with gram positive rods, did I need to share my screen? Share screen. Oh, there we go. Here we go. It is recording. And then we're going to go here. So we have a few to talk about today. The thing about gram positive rods is this is not one of your better friends that you find, okay? So this is not going to be an everyday occurrence in micro. You hope not. It shouldn't be, okay? So when we do gram staining and we do get to gram positive rods and we see gram positive rods, it's usually, that's what I remember most, that was the end of the day because that sample just got referenced out because we could not finish up a gram positive rod. Okay. So we're going to see that quite a bit with the names of these that are about to pop up. These are some bad, bad uh, organisms. Um, and when we have them, it, it's, it's time to send them to the reference lab. So keep that in mind as we get going. So we have corny, corine bacteria, corine bacterium, corny bacterium species is the first one we'll start with. And we have probably a recognizable um, name coming up, but this morphology is pleomorphic, but it has something unique, it's called club shape. So you can say club shape, you can say drumstick shape, uh, wing shape, what, I mean like wing, you eat shape kind of thing, like a drumstick, kind of that look to it. So there's a gram positive rod, it is catalase positive, this whole species of uh, Corine bacterium. Non-spore forming, okay, which is A sporogenesis. And non-modal, we're going to see one that's going to be modal. And the environment is where these, most of all of these hang out. Uh, soil, water, but also on the human skin for uh, Corine bacteria. So I don't know if you can find a first, first thing you need to say is what? Oh, that's gram positive rod. Yes, yeah, right. That would be the first check here with our slide. Um, looks like to me, I mean, yes, could I make it out as a wing? Yeah, that's, you know, if, if I really tried club, you know, just like, I, I hard to say for sure if you know what clubs are, I'm not sure. Here's our big one though, diphtheria. Okay, so uh, Corine bacterium diphtheriae. Uh, this is in our throat, nasal pharynx, especially our areas of pseudomembrane. Uh, we may be collecting this. Uh, suspected carriers can test their throat and their nasal pharynx with swabs. So, you know, there's people that carry this one around and can spread it. With the growth, first off, what, what is, where, where have we heard diphtheria before? Anybody? I didn't mean to just walk right by that. Anybody? Childhood vaccinations, maybe? Is that part of the D? Is this DPT? Is that diphtheria, pertussis? And tetanus, or is that DPT vaccination? Yay. Has anybody heard of that? All right. So we're in chapter, where are we? 16? We're in 16. And I think for uh, Corine, Corine, we're There's a treatment, there's prevention, there's the antibody susceptibility, there's camp test, molecular diagnosing, MALDI, there's a lot in here. Cultivation. So 
respiratory diphtheria. But yes, part of our DPT. The media you need to think about with is that we need telluride for growth requirement. So blood and medium containing telluride is chlorine A bacterium's diphtheria requirement. So it can be cysteine telluride, it can be Tinsdale medium. Any of those have telluride in them. So we always try to make sure you associate telluride with chlorine A bacterium. Temperature is a little less than 37, so we wouldn't really make a big change in the temperature. Because most of the time our incubators aren't up to 37. They, if you open the door, they're up to 36 already. And then we have um, Wafflers medium which is a bovine serum that stimulates the distinctive morphology of diphtheria. So if we get diphtheria by itself, just on our regular medium, we don't see the distinctive morphology. So here's blood auger. Looks like most of our smaller organisms growing. A little grayer. So staining depends upon the medium and the stain, the media and the stain use. So if you gram stain off the Leffler's medium, the club-shaped rod with a beaded appearance is there. Okay, if you do not gram stain off the Leffler's medium, then you're not going to see that. So it says gram stain blood auger plate by itself, they stain more evenly and closely resembles all the other species of just a gram negative rod. We see a distinct change when we pick it up off the uh, specialized media for diphtheria, which is lawful. Is that from here or Zoom? I think it's from here. Methylene blue stain. The Loeffler's rods are blue with reddish metachromic chromatic granules. So we're going to see some pictures. Here's more what we mean by the drumstick or the club. Um, you know, I was big into like army too, you know, when I was a kid. It looks like the grenade launchers. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Like you have like a stick and you have the grenade up top and you throw it. Anybody remember those movies where they had that? They would like take the pin out of the grenade and then sling it. Just on it. No. Okay, kind of reminds me of that, but as you can see, the club. In right here. So you don't see that unless you gram stain off Loeffler's medium, which would, would contain, you think what? It contains telluride or is Loeffler's by itself? What does Loeffler's contain? All right, let's go back here. It has bovine serum that stimulates distinctive morphology. So it's not really Tinsdale medium, it's just bovine serum that for getting that club shape. So this, that would be key to uh, chlorine bacterium diphtheria's distinct shape uh, that we get on a gram stain. Here's without it, there's with it, right? Without, with, okay. Okay, so just like a normal gram, you know, if we came right off the of blood auger, it looked just like this, gram piles of rock. The morphology, the cysteine telluride auger, the, the chlorine A bacterium appears gray or black. In the Loeffler slant, it's white or gray. So uh, we see gray on both. So if I was going back here, I mean, that's a grayish colony. Biochemical identification, incubate, may require seven days. So these, that's why if we do get grandpas of rods, we're probably not hanging out. We probably don't have Loeffler's medium. We probably don't have Tinsdale Telluride medium in the lab to do this. So that's why we would send it for special ID. Uh, incubation period up to seven days with Tinsdale auger, this is the one with Telluride. The diphtheria, and then another species named pseudotuberculosis and ulcerin, uh, have black colonies surrounded by a brown halo. Other chlorine A bacterium species, the, the diphtheroids, no brown halos. 
So these, the diphtheria, pseudotuberculosis, and others, and ulcerins have black colonies surrounded by brown halos. We can see that. So there you go. So this would be our Tinsdale medium that we would use. Here's the black colony with the brown halo. See that pretty well. Black colonies, brown halo. Here's some biochemical, you know, we got diphtheria, nitrate positive, pseudotuberculosis is urease and nitrate, and ulcerans is urease with no nitrate. So you would have nitrate being positive for two of the species, and um, urease, again, pseudotuberculosis has both, and ulcerans has the one. So what makes diphtheria so problematic? It's a toxin producer. So the diphtheria do not produce the toxin which causes diphtheria. They can colonize the upper respiratory tract without causing disease. They must be differentiated from the toxic strains and therefore isolated from diphtheria must be followed by toxicity testing. Let's read that one more time. Let's make sure we're clear. Toxin production. Some strains of C. diphtheria do not produce toxin. Okay, but don't, don't make it mess up on that. Corine bacterium diphtheria does produce, produce toxin, or a strain of it can. Not all strains do. They do colonize the upper respiratory tract without causing disease if they're not toxin producers. And you must differentiate the toxigenic strains from the non toxigenic. And what you have to do is you have to isolate, followed by to toxigenicity testing. And the test that is associated with big test letters, this means this is going to be on the test, is the ELEC test or the ELEC plate, which is a type of serological test which relies on antigen antibody reactive to produce a precipitin line. And that's how we distinguish between the toxin producing and non toxin producing diphtheria. Everybody got cleared a little better on that now that I've read it again. So here is the ELIC test. So you have this antitoxin impregnated paper strip through the middle. Okay, and then we have specific precipitin lines. And then you have bacterial growth. So these would be our colony streets. So this would be like diphtheria one or the dip, you know, we would do that. And if we get lines of identity, which are round, kind of makes it you're in immunology, right? Everybody's had immunology or having it. Then you know that what? That's an ID line if it is what? If it's round, right, if we round out. So here is This is the antitoxin here. All right. So the biggest thing to remember is the name of that test. ELEC plate, serological test to determine if diphtheria is a toxin or food producing strain or a non-producing strain. And that's how we distinguish the two. Clinical significance, most common disease is diphtheria. Respiratory droplets makes it easy to spread. The disease affects respiratory tracts locally and exerts systematic effects due to the exotoxin, which causes cell necrosis in the heart and peripheral nerves. Well, it's not, not a good one. That's why we say these are, these are none of these are um, ones that we want to see. Symptoms, sore throat, headache, and nausea. The pharyngeal membrane may result in death due to asphyxiation. Wow. Pharyngeal membrane basically cuts off the airflow. So you actually have asphyxiation happening due to diphtheria. 10 year old boy with severe diphtheria, bull neck associated with it, severe myocarditis. 
all vaccines were contraindicated. Skin lesion. The toxins absorbed into the blood where it causes damage to heart muscles and nerve damage. And then we have another test that we could test for um, immunity, the Schick test, where we put a small amount of dip diphtheria under the skin and those that have immunity due to past infections or a vaccine possess neutralizing antibody that react with the toxin so there's no visible skin reaction to be seen. Okay, kind of opposite from the tuberculin test, right? Tuberculin, if we've had it, we sensitize to it, and we actually react. Individuals susceptible to infection lack neutralizing antibody and therefore the injection of the toxin results in a necrosis, localized edema, or erythema and edema at the site of injection. Has anybody ever had a diphtheria skin test, a chick test? No, I hope not, yeah, right? But you've had the vaccine, then you should have what? Should have antibodies to this, so you shouldn't have the reaction. But I wouldn't wanna, you know, gamble that with my skin. It sounds kind of horrifying, it's the chick test. Where we get like, it maybe looks like this after they get through, right? You definitely don't want that. So injection of an inactivated diphtheria toxin leads to production of neutralizing antibodies and immunization is the best means of prevention. Makes sense, we've all probably had the DPT maybe multiple times through our life. Just comes blocked up, so like, you know, um, I had to have the tetanus, so I went ahead and did the DPT. Had a little boost. Uh, treatment, if it comes to that, we need an inactivation of the toxin. So we need to inactivate the toxin with antitoxin and eliminate the organism, prevent further production of the toxin. That was the way we would want to treat it, but we have to go into, if we have to, we may be in supportive therapy where we have a trachostomy. Efforts to minimize congestive heart failure also might be necessary. So this doesn't sound like a fun infection to get. So would we still see it today? Could we? Yeah, right? We got kids that don't get vaccinated these days. They could definitely come down with diphtheria. So don't, don't just rule this out because you think 99% of the population has been vaccinated. We can definitely see new cases pop up. Again, the general characteristics of the pleomorphic club-shaped gram-positive rod. In biochemical identification, we have urease, fermentation, nitrate, motility, et cetera, for a conventional test. And that one has, I can see a little bit of the club up here. So there's a club, just a fat end to it of this gram-positive rod. We have some others, other clinical significant species of Fourine bacteriums are ulcerans, which may colonize upper respiratory tract, all sore throat, may cause diphtheria, rare cases. Pseudotuberculosis associated with lymphadenitis and pneumonia with individuals who have contact with animals. We have Corine bacterium. I'm gonna, let's go, where is, where's Cadence? Cadence, I need help with. Yike, 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 Everybody like that one? Yike, yike, Is that good? Somebody's back there just giggling because they're like, he cannot pronounce anything. Right, or, or you're back there sitting, I hope he doesn't call on me to cry that one. He doesn't I'm kind of doing that with a yee. Yike, yike. I'm kind of putting J in there. Do you want to go with Ikeum without the J, silent J? Yeah. Okay, who agrees? Who wants to go Ikeum? Or do you want to go Jikeum? 
Well, I would, I would, you know, like me, if I'm a bad speller, I always like to say every, try to get every letter in, so I don't like misspelling. So I would probably say Jiki, uh, Jiki, just so I remember to put the J in front. It is the most common diphthoroid, diphtheria-like, dip, diphtheroid isolate, and it's associated with nosocomial infection. It's part of the normal microbiota of our skin. And <laughs> infection has been linked to prosthetic devices and catheterization, especially in immunocompromised individuals with cancer and malignancy. Prolonged hospital stays or undergoing invasive procedures and receiving broad spectrum antibiotics are most at risk of coming down with the nosocomial uh, GQ. No GQ. All right, any questions about uh, Corine bacterium, diphtheria, diphtherioids? And then we get to go to my one of my all-time favorites here because I actually did a report in high school on this one too. Uh, Listeria monocytogenes. So I did get that one. I think I'm pretty good on that one. So I had to practice back in like ninth grade on that. Um, anybody heard of Listeria? It, it pops in the news every so often. Could have been your ice cream maker if you like Bluebell. I think that was what they dealt with. What was the one with the cut up fruit? Cut up fruit? Could be this one. Um, it was an L one. Might have been this one. Yeah. Usually we see this one with like cheese, like cheese product sometimes. But this is a good one. This is Listeria monocytogenes. We actually have this one downstairs. So we'll probably break this one out and actually grow this one up for you. Gram positive rod or gram positive cacobacilli. The environment is the gastrointestinal tract of many animal species. That's why we see it sometimes hit our food supply. Human disease, high morbidity and mortality in the fetus. So infection, transplacenta leaves via the birth canal, infants, immunocompromised hosts. And we see it with animal products. That's where we see it with our cheese, fruits and vegetables. But we do see it in a variety of places and these outbreaks do happen. I want to, you know, if you're bluebell like me, bluebell had this. It was in their plant in Texas, and they had to shut. And almost went. I think they did go bankrupt for a little bit. And I don't know if you know this, but ice cream companies, since I've seen a couple of them here lately, they seem very on the just just on the edge of either making it or going bankrupt. Because so when this plant got shut down, it put it put bluebell into bankruptcy. I don't know if y'all are big ice cream eaters or not, but yes, that, that hurts when you don't see bluebell on your shelf. Yeah, it's this disease. Or... Good. So when did that happen? Uh, my mom sent it to me like earlier this or this past week. Oh, it was so it's located. Uh, or is it just one of those nationwide? It was just recall? the Arkansas Department of Health. Uh, Country Fresh and Recalling Limited of uh, their like cut up fruit and stuff from Westeria. Yep. We're going to see what makes it such a problem here in just a minute. We'll see that story. All right, Grandpa's of Rod or Coco Basilla. Most commonly isolated from our blood or central uh, cerebral spinal fluid. So the tissue biopsy specimens must be ground before inoculating the media. So it's again one of those that you know it's not just easy to grow. Grows on conventional media. It is a beta hemolytic sheep blood auger. Okay, so we'll see that. But this is where it's a problem. Cold temperatures. Cold temperatures inhibit normal microbiota, but not Listeria. So that's where we're like, this is where we get in trouble. We think, oh, well, the cheese was in the refrigerator, or the milk was in the refrigerator, or gosh, it was ice cream. My, my gosh, it's frozen, right? So this one doesn't you know, keep going, okay? That cold temperature doesn't affect Listeria. So that's a good thing to remember. We incubate them at four degrees Celsius in cryptic soy broth. Cold enrichment, so four degrees is refrigeration. 
We sell culture the ball weekly for a month. Um, but it grows in unconventional mode already, and we'll see that. Temperature requirements uh, 35 degrees Celsius with or without CO2. And, and colony morphology resembles group B strep. We just said what? It's beta hemolytic. Right? So don't give up on, you know, that's why gram stain would be important, right? Gram positive rod versus what's group B strep? If you're M negative, group B. Well, no. where's your, who's helping me? Who's got my trusty little sheet? Go. Positive coxide, right? So if you can't read the gram stain, it could mess you up if you go down line stereo. All right. We see, I have seen group B strep more in the past couple of weeks than I ever thought I would. And these are from throat swabs. <laughs> you know, because they throat swab for group what? What group are we looking for with a throat swab? Group A, right? Did y'all study for this thing today? Okay, I hope so. I know it's open book. A group A, beta hemolytic, right? But there also we also have beta hemolytic group B, right? Sometimes we have to chase that uh, because we'll see it not be sensitive to certain antibodies. And we have to go forward find group B. Anyway, all right, so there it is growing on a blood auger plate. Biochemically, it's catalase positive, camp test positive. We can, we, we're familiar with the camp test. Uh, hypuric hydrolysis and esculin and growth in sodium chloride Look like all positive. I don't know why I don't have a positive with growth. I guess because we said growing in 6.25 sodium chloride. Motility, though, this is what we want to show. We got to, we're going to put this on demo, we hope. We have some motility medium, and we're going to try to make sure we can get an umbrella shaped pattern. So, what does that look like? I think I have a picture. Oh, maybe I don't. Maybe you're not coming to the lab to find out. I thought I had a picture. Sorry. Um, Umbrella shaped pattern, which means that it migrates out. So we'll put a like needle through the media of last period, like straight in, straight out. And then when we see the growth, what we're going to see is it's going to, like at the top, closer to the oxygen, it kind of branches out a little bit into the media. And it looks like you're holding, like, I know it's hard to visualize, but it looks like you're holding an umbrella. Okay, so umbrella, the top is bigger than the bottom uh, with this pattern. Uh, umbrella shaped pattern of growth for Lysteria monosatogenes in motility media. So we have a lab, we have that for a lab coming up. The clinical significance of Lysteria monosatogenes, it's a flu like illness with GI distress. That's healthy in adults. If you're immunocompromised, it quickly goes to meningitis and septicemia. And the most common clinical disease is neonatal sepsis. Not good for uh, young young kids if they're ingesting what? Ingesting cheese, milk, plant foods, and meat contaminated with this organism. And it's always a, a surprise because you don't think, hey, I kept it in the fridge. I wasn't expecting, you know, that to be contaminated. So it's the third leading cause of death from food poisoning in the United States, according to CDC. Especially dangerous with anyone with a weakened immune system, over 65, or pregnant. Symptoms usually occur four weeks of an, within four weeks. See, that's like a month out, and all of a sudden you're sick. You're like, right? Infection can last, take as long as 70 days to appear. 70 days, right? I mean, I wouldn't, I couldn't even remember like what I, if I ate something 70 days ago, more or less, what was the name of the company that had the bad fruit? What was it again? Country Fresh Fruit. Did anybody buy Country Fresh Fruit in the last 70 days at the grocery store and eat it? Don't know, right? Is it in your freezer? If it is, it's not yet. Um, so we get first signs is diarrhea, other GI symptoms, 
Typically, symptoms follow include headache, stiff neck, fever, muscle pain, confusion, loss of balance, and convulsion. So today, if you had an infection of this, what would they say? Suffering from COVID, right? Everything would be a COVID infection today. You would call these symptoms. Well, yeah, COVID, I heard he called this diarrhea. That's why we ran out of toilet paper. Uh, headaches and stiff neck, you know. You got confusion, yes, because I said you can't you lose your memory, right? You can't remember what you did last, yeah. All that good stuff. Pregnant women, especially at risk for your CAC, 10 times more likely in a Listeria infection. The odds are even higher with a Hispanic pregnant woman who are 24 times more likely to get Listeria. So we see this in the Southwest. Okay, so like Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, that area. Is usually a very high uh, area. Although pregnant women typically experience only flu like symptoms, the danger is to the fetus. Infections during pregnancy can lead to miscarriage, premature delivery, stillborn. Newborns with listeriosis can develop blood infections and meningitis. We just heard neonatal sepsis. Serious potential of life threatening complications, and we treat it with antibiotics. So we do have that option here with because it's a is a gram positive rod. 1985, there were 105 deaths associated with ingestion of contaminated cheese in California. That's probably about the time I did my report. If y'all are wondering about the time I picked this up. The cheese, which was implicated in the outbreak, it had been imported from Mexico. 65 deaths were in fetuses and newborns. So 65, 105 were fetuses and newborns. So miscarriages and and newborns. None of the mothers did, did die, so at least a little bright spot back in 85. The remaining cases were older immunocompromised individuals, which we just almost like said, you know, so be it with those, right? COVID-19, if you're immunocompromised or you've had other lying conditions, you're just part of the statistic now, right? Y'all see how we do that? Right? We're saying, how many people have, have you seen a post it says 99% of the people are getting over COVID. Like, okay. But everybody's susceptible. So that 1% is huge. It's not like 1% of the one, you know, anyway. I, I, I don't, I'll get upset. But. So, so we, don't, we just write these off. We just go, oh, so, so, you know, they're going to die anyway, right? They were, they were, they had underlying conditions. They were unhealthy. They were diabetic. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, those are the ones that should be at home wearing N95 masks when they go out. They shouldn't even be going out, right? Shouldn't be even going out. So we're going to lock somebody down. Population. Sorry. Clinical significance. So. Carriers, one to five percent of the population has Listeria monocytogenes is colonized in GI or your urogenital tract. So you could be carrying Listeria monocytogenes. Neonates, transmission is transplacental through the birth canal or through the birth canal. In these cases, account for 50% of human cases. Is anybody upset about this? Would you be? Oh, they're neonates, you know. Childbirth's tough sometimes, right? No, we wouldn't be doing that, right? We'd be putting out notices from the health department saying, country fresh, throw it away, right? They found it, and then where did they probably find it? They probably found it through a lab, hopefully through their QC testing. They finally, or somebody complained about getting sick after eating it. So hopefully there won't be this neonate dying of eating fruit out of the bag. Okay. So we had two, two like uplifting, you know, diphtheria and Listeria monocytogenes, right? So gram positive rods are, are you don't want to miss them. Okay, you don't want to miss that. Um, and, and I walked in, I walked in Saturday morning to a gram stain that said gram positive rods. That's what I got to walk in on. Somebody that had, had a blood culture positive. And they stained it, and they stained it gram positive rot and gram negative rods. Okay? So it kind of got me going, <laughs> well, 
let's see what it looks like. And so we grew it out and looked at it. It's just one organism, so it's not both. I don't have a gram positive and a gram negative rod growing. But I got gram negative rod. You know, it, it was it was some, some crystal violet hanging on. You all have seen that before, right? You've seen your gram stains not give up all the purple. But the majority of the, the, the cells, the gram rods were gram negative. So keep that in mind. Give you a little helpful hint. Don't write both. Give some money up. Dress out when I walk in and see grandpa's a rod sitting in a blood culture. All right. Cadence. I'm, I'm just going to give this one to you. This, this is all yours. Anybody else want to try? I keep picking on Cadence. I, I hope she doesn't mind. But I can pick on somebody else. I can even pick on Zoom. Zoom wants to try. You good? I'm not the first one. I'll say it at least it's good. At least it's low Yeah, like that. Ruzio Crassio. Good. Okay. That's a good one. You want me to try? Yeah. Uh, Aristipolo. Okay. Theryx. How about that? Ruzio Pathy. I'll go with that. Anybody from Zoom want to try? I don't want to leave y'all out. All right, morphology, pleomorphic, long, slender, gram-positive rod, environment, soil, and animal product. The disease is erysipeloid. Transmission, contamination of the wound with soil or animal product. So uh, we can definitely see this. There it is, gram-positive rod. And this is what I mean, look behind all that. You know, the, you know, but you've got some, you know, don't give me gram negative back here. Okay, with that look there, mine was right opposite. Mine was like purple, 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 and then all this was red. So you can definitely see that gram positive rod. So we usually do a biopsy or aspirate from the lesion that's on the skin. We can do blood cultures if it's disseminated. Uh, incubation two days at 35 degrees Celsius. Atmosphere best if we elevate it into the CO2 or even go anaerobically because this organism is microaerophilic, which means it grows but grow, does grow in ambient air. So, microaerophilic, so a small amount of oxygen, this one still can grow. So, it's not an anaerobe, okay, but it can grow, it might help it to go anaerobically uh, to reduce down the oxygen level. Uh, catalase negative, that's different, right? Where our other two both catalase positive. H, H2S, so sodium hydroxide producer, is that hydroxide or hydro sulfur? What is S? What's H2S? Let me ask my chemist here. Dihydrogen, that's very good. I like that. So you corrected me. Thank you. Dihydrogen sulfide. All right, motility negative. Okay, so it's non-modal compared to who? Who had a had an umbrella-shaped motility? Umbrella-shaped motility? No. Well, they're all bacillus. So we're not on bacillus and drag yet, huh? Listeria monocytogeny. That's it. Yes, yes. Kind of looks the same. It's got that same look on blood auger there. Does have some hemolytic stage there, it looks like. So, this erysipeloid, this uh, localized skin infection, hand trauma. So, purplish red lesion resembling a strep erysipelas. There is, whoa, yeah. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, that's, that just might be with the bean. I don't know. Maybe I see a few purple in there. All right. Then we get, we, I think this is our finishing, our, our finish up part of this, I think. 
is bacillus. So, so far we've had um, Corinae bacterium dip diphtheria, we've had Listeria monocytogeny, we've had erysipelatherix, right? Is that good? Okay. And now we're on bacillus species. So these are large gram-positive rods which can, can become gram-variable or gram-negative with age. So we've heard, I think we've seen this before, like the colony's old, might not, if we do a gram stain with it, we may not get the true gram positive. Spores. Spores with bacillus appear as clear spaces within the vegetative cell or, or green with a spore stain. So again, bacillus, you know anything about bacillus, the soil, the environment, incubate to 35 degrees with or without CO2. And all species except anthracis are modal. Okay, so anthracis would be like our erysipatory theories. It is non-modal. There you go. Big gram positive. So, so my gram stain buddy the other day would have put gram positive rods in chains. Okay, that's what he would have finished with there. So spores, if you don't know anything about spores, the way a, a microorganism or bacteria will protect itself, right? If it gets spores in the soil, it can hang out there. It can withstand the environment. It can withstand no water, no nothing, no host, doesn't need anything, right? It just stands there until a host picks it up. And this host is probably going to be a cow with his nose down in the dirt trying to eat grass. And that's how it's going to pick up, okay? So you have to watch this with cattle, if you didn't already know that. Specimen collection, blood culture should be collected for all cases if you suspect an anthrax. And we had this with bioterrorism. You remember 9-11, it was the idea that, well, what if they just start sending anthrax out, mailing it to people, infecting people with the spore they put in an envelope and you open it up. Right? We went through, I don't know if y'all were old enough to go through all that, but there's still packages that show up to certain offices that are suspected, or better yet, we had post office people die from this because they handled the package of the suspected anthrax. That was probably domestic terrorism because some whoever sitting at home put this in an envelope thought it'd be cool to send it to a few offices in Washington. Right? This is going this is going on. So don't don't think we may not, we may or may not see anthrax being used this way. Uh, cutaneous anthrax, collect fluid from the vesicle using a syringe, grows well on blood auger, nutrient auger. We can use PEA auger plates for specimen containing normal flora. So PEA allows gram positives to grow and keeps the other stuff down. So we definitely can use that as a selective medium. So the morphology for Bacillus anthracis is large, rough, gray colonies with swirling projections, which is the Medusa head colony. Okay, hemolysis is no hemolysis, non-hemolytic. So this is, we're going to see this Medusa head start to form. See this around it? Y'all see that? Maybe. And this is like the key. This is like in every lab in the hospital, how it wicks up and it starts to grow. So you can wick it up off the colony, off the basement of the auger. It's a spore, if a spore forming gram positive rod, which is non hemolytic, non modal, catalase positive, and has characteristic morphology, we send it, we send it up. We, we, we package it and say somebody else to deal with this, right? And we send it to a reference lab for ID. So you have a spore forming gram positive rod. How would you know, right? You grew this up and you gram stain. The disease is often seen in ruminants. Ruminants are animals that keep their nose to the ground, grazing. So you can see it in cows. And for us, it's mainly cows. Uh, spores remain viable in the soil for up to 50 years, over 50 years. 
Trauma introduces this organism into wounds. Death due to septicemia may occur in just a few hours of the first symptoms. Recontamination occurs within the urine, feces, and later the blood of the carcass of the infected animal. So you can probably see how this could spread or you're handling dead cows out in your field. Let's take a look. Human disease follows the exposure to the infected animal or the animal product. So this is the one that was being sent, okay? Pulmonary inhalation anthrax. Wool sorter, that's kind of how it got its name because you had cases back when you did what, right? A sheep would be considered a ruminant eating off the ground, right? You could definitely have uh, inhalation of the spores as you're doing what? Shaving the sheep, right? You can have cutaneous anthrax, most common form in the human, 95%. Inoculation of the spore into the skin. Anybody wanna take a guess how you could I was scared to death because I got to do vaccinations one day. They put the calves in the chute. They said, all right, you take that gun loaded with anthrax vaccine and it's a live vaccine and you shoot it into the cow. Okay. So if I accidentally shot it myself, what would happen? Probably would have been cutaneous anthrax. Um, first, there's a lesion, resembles an insect bite, later becomes necrotic, fluid filled vesicle. Containing the gram, not, uh, gram negative rod, a black eschar or scab comes up and it's 20% mortality. So, probably not the best that I was sitting on top of a, a cow chute with a needle in my hand and putting needles in cows' necks for vaccination. GI tract infections, the rarest form seen, and that's ingestion of those spores. Mortality is associated with invasion of the blood. If you get it in the bloodstream, it's 95% mortality rate. So here's a, a little snip from Science Mag. It says, uh, B. anthracis kills few people naturally, but exquisitely suitable for use as a bioweapon. Spores can be weaponized and delivered by the trillions as invisible odorless aerosols. Shortly after the 9-11 attack in New York, anthrax powder was mailed to several politicians and journalists on the East Coast, and 22 people were infected with five deaths. And this wasn't, this was not foreign. This was domestic. These were just people that wanted to take advantage of the situation. Okay. So there's that black escar skin. Here's a cerebral hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging, and then we have due to graphic nature of the viewer discretion is advised. So here is a eye infection with bacillus anthracis. This is pulmonary anthrax. Note the large mediastinum, mediastinum here. They're large, rough, beta hemo. Oh, sorry, we changed gear. Sorry, I was going to say I didn't think it was beta hemolytic, but we changed gear. So we've got Bacillus cereus. And this is a large, rough, beta hemolytic colony. Septicemia, wound infection, and pneumonia. So another Bacillus. It can cause serious eye infections. Gram positive rods seen in the gram stain of material from the eye. Food poisoning with bacillus serious outbreaks characterized by vomiting. One to five hours after ingestion, grains, especially rice, have been implicated with bacillus serious. There's our gram negative, I mean our gram positive, sorry, gram positive rod. So this is key, because what is that right there? You get a gram positive rod, what is that opening right there, you think? That's the spore forming, okay? So we got spore forming ground positive rod. That's what that is, that's a spore. I don't think we've seen anything like that. Y'all might look at some plates today and go, yeah, 
that's so serious. He put it on there for me. But uh, no, that's, that's, you know, beta hemolytic. All right, questions? We're gonna stop the share. Now wait on questions. If Zoom has some questions, if you have some questions. So Graham, pause the rod. Uh, I'm not gonna be growing any anthrax downstairs. I think I have Listeria monocytogenes, and I think I have Aerostipulus spirits. So we definitely can get some out and let you ground stain them and see what they are. See what they look like. All right, no questions. We'll see you at 12.30. Give you 30 minutes to get ready. For your big lab exam number one. See y'all later.